Uh, your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, uh, and dear friends, uh, a good morning to all of you and to our online audience. A good afternoon and good evening, wherever you may be. And welcome to this uh, special session for us um, here at IPI entitled, When We Know Better, We Do Better, the LC Initiative and Improving uh, Mission Environments. Um, and we are especially privileged to have the partners of the LC Initiative with us uh, this morning, led by Canada. And I'm delighted to see Ambassador Bob Ray here, and he'll be speaking to us in a few minutes. Um, as you all know, the LC Initiative uh, for sorry, Women in Peace Operations is a 10-year project over two phases from 2019 to 2022, and then the next phase, 2022 to 2027, promoted by Global Affairs Canada, that aims to increase uniformed women's meaningful participation in UN peace operations. Today's event marks the fifth anniversary of the launch of the initiative in November 2017 in Vancouver, on the margins of the UN Peacekeeping Defense Ministerial. And in recent years, research by the UN and other institutions, including IPI, has shown that UN peacekeeping mission environments themselves can be significant barriers to increasing women's meaningful participation in UN peace operations. Uh, specific barriers and missions can include the physical environment, the culture of a mission, and the prevalence of sexual harassment. Uh, today, we aim to provide a venue for women peacekeepers to share their experiences directly with member states and senior UN leaders about their respective workplace or peacekeeping work workplace environments. We also hope to promote policy relevant research findings. And at the back of the room, you will see we're showcasing an exhibit on gender responsive peacekeeping camp designs created by the UN Department of Operational Support. And I'm delighted to see the Under Secretary General Atul Kari with us uh, this morning. And he too will be addressing us uh, in a few minutes. And then finally, we want to raise awareness about, LC, about the LC Initiative's five-year expansion and extension to 2027. Um, with that, I, it now gives me great pleasure to uh, welcome and uh, ask Ambassador Bob Ray, the Permanent Representative of Canada, uh, to make a few remarks from the podium. Please, Ambassador. Push, I can do that. Thank you so much. It's great to be here. And thank you so much, uh, uh, Zaid, for your introduction. Um, I, uh, I think it's, uh, it's really important that we understand that Canada launched this initiative because we felt that the exclusion of of women uh, from the work of peacekeeping, uh, while not a formal exclusion, was a de facto exclusion, and therefore we needed to encourage change. Uh, and uh, we've seen this change uh, in our own uh, policing and in our own military. Uh, it's had come with huge challenges, and uh, the UN is no exception to the challenges. Um, we remain firmly committed to uh, the LC initiative, and I'll be making a very brief uh, announcement about an additional uh, funding that we want to do to concentrate on the issue of sexual harassment. Uh, perhaps I'll start with that. Canada is announcing uh, a commitment of uh, half a million dollars Canadian to, uh, I stress this Canadian because I don't want anybody to accuse me of bad faith when we when they get the check. Uh, as we know, the checks are changing these days. We have to be aware of that. But uh, we are really committed to working hard on dealing in particular with issues of sexual harassment, which still exist. And uh, it's shameful. Uh, and it's uh, it's something we have to continue to deal with. But we want to make sure that uh, that we're continuing to work particularly on that uh, on, on that issue. C'est un grand plaisir pour moi de pouvoir uh, renforcer l'importance de l'initiative RC. Uh, Jusqu'à quel point c'est important pour nous de d'avoir de, 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 uh, une initiative qui a été tant de succès. Il y a tant de défis, mais quand même, ça va ça va mieux que, que au moment où, où on a commencé. 
notre, euh, notre point de départ, ce n'est pas une initiative qui est exclusivement canadienne, c'est une initiative qui dépend sur les partenariats effectifs sur le terrain. This is about partnerships that work on the ground. It's not about uh, a, a, an exclusively Canadian initiative. It's about how we work with, uh, with many member countries uh, who ha have a great number of troops and a great commitment to, uh, to peacekeeping and how we work with them to build up uh, the participation of women and uh, the, uh, the ability of women to work freely, openly, equally, and with complete confidence that their presence and their participation is, is welcome and, and, and is more than just welcome, it's, it's uh, celebrated. So we will hear, I think, during the panel discussion elsewhere about the, our initiatives with Zambia, with Ghana, uh, and with Senegal, which are all examples of projects where we are, we are working with, with, with member states to reinforce the importance of the engagement of, uh, of, uh, of working with, um, making sure that women are, are able to fully participate. We're very proud of this, um, but we look uh, and, and recognize that there are also uh, tremendous challenges. I would encourage you to have a look at the exhibits that I think give us, give all of us a sense as to what and how much needs to still to be done. Uh, but it's nevertheless extremely important that we take stock of what we're doing, that we learn from where we've been. I think the, the importance of candor in these discussions is extremely important. There, there are no, uh, no comments that are not welcome and understood. We all have to learn how to do it better. Uh, and I think and that's, that's the spirit with which we enter this conversation. Not that we have uh, created uh, anything that's perfect, but that we have, uh, have, have uh, created something which... Uh, which we think is exceptionally important if we're serious about equality and if we're serious about changing the dynamic of peacekeeping and peace building, which we know will never be effective unless women are, are, are uh, thoroughly and deeply and equally involved uh, in everything that we do. Um, so just to finish with a quote, uh, you have heard me say this before, but I, I, I keep repeating it because uh, he's, he, he's one of our proudest uh, a poet is Leonard Cohen, who said that there are no perfect offerings. Uh, there, there is a crack in everything, uh, but that's where the light gets in. And I think the LC initiative is one of those things that helps us get the light into these projects and helps us to make a difference. So thank you very much for this opportunity. Thank you very much, uh, Ambassador Ray. It now, now gives me great pleasure to invite Ambassador Carlos Samarin the permanent representative of Uruguay uh, to the UN to address us. Please, sir. Well, um, thank you very much. Uh, well, first, I would like to thank my dear colleagues from Canada, Germany, Zambia, and also wish to, to you, our host, and Pronimpi, uh, and uh, my friend, uh, Atul Kare, and as a reactionary from your UN woman. First of all, I would like to recognize the role of Canada with the ELSI initiative. We are working with it, and I think it's a very, very important uh, program to, I mean, to help everybody. And we are very happy to be, can be contributing and receive some also contribution in, in our uh, endeavors in this area. Uruguay believes firmly in the need uh, to keep debating and looking for new approach for the participation of women in peacekeeping. And in this sense, we are working on the barriers identified in the MOHIP report. I think this is a good opportunity to just to show you what are our, our problems in order to just could be a, a case to, to discuss or to, to show others. In a very succinct descript, description, the principal barriers identif identified in our countries are, first, there is still a stigma for mothers who deploy when they, they have children. So women tend to deploy them when they are younger. Other family responsibilities, such as having elderly dependents, can affect a woman's decision to deploy. 
In this sense, work will be done to strengthen the care system to facilitate the deployments. The second barrier identified for us is that women may not feel prepared to handle situations where they must interact with peacekeeper from countries where women are less visible or in settings where host countries' genders north are more rigid. I think it's very common, this problem. This led to assisting wide effort, joint effort as hearing negative experience from other women may affect the decision on their participation. In third place, women are less likely to deploy on dangerous mission and less likely to serve in operational rules. Both because those has lead ones to protect them and because women, women do not want to serve in that. And on the other hand, women are more likely to work in this stereotypically female, female roles, even, even when it involves tasks outside of their duties. This situation hinders the long jet for equal participation of women in all stages and at all levels. We have problems that we have to address informally in this situation about the, the roles in the in our peacekeeping, try to increase the, the participation in, in the contingents itself and not in the administrative support. There are many other barriers, however, that are the, but these are the criticals uh, for us that we want to share with you today. To our panelists, we are eager to learn from your experiences, particularly from the field, and we look forward to your presentation and debate. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ambassador. Thank you, Ambassador Amrin. And now it gives me great pleasure to welcome and invite uh, Ambassador Thomas Peter Zanissen, uh, Deputy Permanent Representative of the Federal Republic of Germany, to the UN to say a few words, please. Sorry, uh, thank you very much. Um, I misplaced my notes, so I have to improvise. <laughs> but I start by well, greeting you from Ambassador Linda. Uh, she should be here. She can't, but uh, so you have to take uh, me as a substitute. But First of all, I, I would like to say why well, we we joined this this group of co-hosts with uh, Zambia, with uh, Uruguay, Mongolia, especially Canada. I think we do that for four reasons, and don't worry, it will be not long. It will be one sentence for each reason. The first one is, um, and I've been in 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 in, uh, in the diplomatic service for a long time. I started in 94, 95 in Rwanda, in a peacekeeping mission, and I cannot remember having seen a single woman. And in 2006, we were in the Congo with the European Union, very few women, and we've come a long way. And I think as a champion for women, peace and security, I think we as Germany have to do whatever is possible to create a, a meaningful environment for female participation in peacekeeping missions. And I think if there's a game change in the last few years, it was the, this initiative. Uh, and I think the LC initiative is not only groundbreaking itself, but the so having set these standards in five years is just short of remarkable. The second point why we support it is simply because we can learn something from this, this initiative. I think it has been also a trend and a groundbreaking initiative inside the UN, the UN system, how you conduct a, a successful initiative. And for both, uh, thank you very much for our trailblazer, Canada. The third one is, uh, as a donor, we're extremely proud of participating in the LC Initiative Fund. I think this is an extremely well-designed, thoughtful, uh, uh, fund that is doing very meaningful projects and uh, very much based on what Ambassador Ray already said, partnerships. And the final one, and then I really stop, is um, the ELSI initiative also helps us to do our homework. I think we don't have to really look into the UN system, we have to start at home. And I think the, the, the title of this meeting today, when we know better, we do better, I think we sh should start at home. And that's what we did two years ago by doing a barrier survey in our own forces and see why are there are so few uh, female participants in peacekeeping still. And we found a couple of information uh, that are actually quite meaningful for, for our future operation and cooperation with the UN. And of course, it's not only lack of information, there is something to it, but it's much more a social, uh, cultural issues um, that we have to address and also, also institutional. So we also need this initiative for our own 
consumption. And with that, um, I'm extremely uh, happy to participate and looking forward to, to this discussion with real experts. And I think, as you said, Ambassador Ray, five years of success, but uh, we are nowhere to the end. And <laughs> let's start the next years from here. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador. Uh, and now I'd like to welcome, and it gives me great pleasure to invite uh, Regina C. Bomafiri, uh, the Deputy Permanent Representative of the Republic of Zambia to the UN to address us, please. Um, thank you so much, um, distinguished ladies and gentlemen. Um, it is an honor for me uh, to join the permanent missions of Canada and Germany as well as um, Uruguay and the International Peace Institute in hosting this event with a focus on the ELSI initiative um, and the importance of improving the environment for peacekeeping operations. Uh, women continue to be underrepresented in peacekeeping operations. Women only represent a very small percentage of all uniformed military, police, justice, and correctional personnel in field missions. And yet the participation of women in peacekeeping operation is known to improve the effectiveness of peacekeeping missions altogether. The participation of women in field missions can improve dispute resolution and peace building efforts. Women peacekeepers are also less likely to use excessive force and can easily win the trust of the communities of the local people in which they serve. Women peacekeepers also have the ability to improve access to community members, thereby helping to improve the overall protection of the civilian po uh, population. Zambia's commitment to matters pertaining to peace and security remain resolute. And as a country, we have continued to play a critical role in UN peacekeeping missions. Today, Zambia ranks among the top 19 contributors of uniformed personnel to uh, various UN peacekeeping operations. The Zambian government values its contribution of uniformed women and looks forward to increasing their participation. We believe women have the ability to improve the effectiveness of peacekeeping operations and to achieve the overall peace in the long run. Zambia is also awake to the fact that the female peacekeepers face various challenges and barriers um, that hinder their full and meaningful participation and representation in peacekeeping operations. And I think uh, Mr. Zaid al Sen also mentioned that um, in his opening remarks. It is against this background that Zambia takes this opportunity to commend the ELSI Initiative for Women in UN Peace Operations and indeed other initiatives for their untiring efforts aimed at increasing the deployment of women in the United Nations peace operations. Zambia is delighted to be one of the pilot countries selected under the LC initiative and upon implementation will increase the deployment of uniformed women, particularly the police women in peace operations. We remain committed to advancing the representation and deployment of women in all service ranks in these peacekeeping operations. And as I end, I wish to reaffirm Zambia's commitment to the UN peace security efforts around the globe. I thank you. Thank you so much. And now I'd like to welcome, and it gives me great pleasure to invite Under Secretary General Atul Kare from the UN Department of Operational Support. Thank you, President, my dear friend, uh, Prince Zaid, Excellencies, distinguished guests, Asa Regner and my other colleagues, dear friends, one and all. I'm really delighted to be here today with you all to celebrate the fifth anniversary of the LC Initiative for Women in Peace Operations uh, launched in Vancouver in November 2017. My special thanks to the co-hosts of this event, Canada, Germany, Uruguay, Zambia, and the IPI, for the opportunity that I have 
to speak on a topic for which I care a great deal. Let me also express my sincere appreciation to all UN member states for their inestimable contribution to peacekeeping during these challenging times and for their contribution to the UN Security Council Resolution 2538 of 2020 that calls for an increase in the deployment of women peacekeepers. Increasing women's meaningful participation in UN peace operations is not just a question of augmenting the sheer number of women peacekeepers, but breaking down barriers, referred to by my dear friend, DPR of Germany, Thomas, and making positions of power and leadership accessible to women within peacekeeping operations. One of these significant barriers includes the mission's physical environment. In my department, the Department of Operational Support, thanks to the generous contribution from the Government of Canada, well, thank you very much, the LC Initiative for Field Missions Project for Applying Gender Considerations in UN Camp Accommodations is progressing considerably. We have been implementing gender-sensitive designs for infrastructure and accommodations in UN peace operations. This improves the well-being of women by ameliorating a range of environmental factors in camps and thus contributing to more receptive conditions. The pilot projects in MINUSCA, MINUSMA, MONUSCO, and UNISPA, which focus on women's accommodation clusters and recreational areas, are good examples of significant improvements to the conditions of women peacekeepers that have been made and can be made. Furthermore, an upcoming pilot project in Minurso, in Western Sahara, will showcase that the LC initiative for field mission designs is indeed an improvement for both women and men. My department will be happy to share the findings and recommendations developed for facilities and infrastructure with all member states to encourage them to incorporate them into their own camp management guidance. Another barrier is related to medical services. We are committed to improving access to medical services, to treat common ailments, and assess gender-adapted projects and equipment. We will also continue to invest in programs for gender-responsive leadership competencies for all mission leaders. With this, as the time is short, let me wish all the panelists and us a very constructive and successful discussion and may the LC initiative continue to reap good results through our shared efforts. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Atul. And now it gives me great pleasure to welcome um, our old friend, Deputy Executive Director Osa Regner of UN Women, please. Thank you so much. Thank you, Said. Thank you to Canada and Germany and all other member states who are here for your support to the ELSI initiative, but also for your support to you and women's work in general, in different capacities in our board, uh, Commission on the Status of Women, etc. Also, I really look forward to listening to our uh, very experienced, distinguished women speakers and to you, Said, as well, uh, to hear about your own experience. I think that will be really, really interesting. Uh, also, thank you, Atul and other UN colleagues for always supporting um, women's rights in whatever the UN is doing. Uh, so we are very, uh, from you and women's side, very proud to uh, host uh, the secretariat of the ELSI Fund. And I'm looking at Deborah Warren, who is <laughs> in fact leading the secretariat. Uh, and obviously at you and women, we really appreciate this initiative. And we do so because it is very concrete. It is evidence-based. It kind of takes us forward from one meeting to the other. It does look uh, at the UN uh, with a critical lens. But it's also important, we think, to have these kinds of discussions so that it, the ELSI initiative comes, comes out and into the, the, all of the other discussions that we have around how we can support 
uh, gender equality, and in this case, uh, women in uniform in the peacekeeping uh, missions. So uh, the, as we've heard, the ELSI initiative is a mechanism to finance innovative solutions for the deployment and meaningful participation of uniformed women. Uh, obviously, also thank you to Canada for the announcement you just made, Ambassador, about the a half a million uh, Canadian dollars against sexual harassment. And as we know, it's also five years since the Me Too movement came out. And for us at UN Women, we do see that the Me Too movement really opened eyes and doors for gender equality uh, in, in, in many, many different uh, spheres. And sexual harassment is extremely important to combat in this context, but it's also, I think, to highlight, you know, the different values that we still give to women and men. And whether women's status is as high as men's uh, in uh, both within UN work, in this, keep, uh, in this case, peacekeeping missions, and in everything that we do in relation to the world around us. So I think that to, to remind five years after Me Too about that is extremely valuable. So thank you so much for that. In addition to supporting troop and police uh, um, contributing countries, and thank you, Sambia, for your intervention uh, earlier, to uh, access project funding and gender strong unit premiums. The fund can also support a limited number of targeted pilot programs uh, in United Nations missions. Um, and they are designed to enhance deployment con uh, conditions and improve the living and working conditions of uniform uh, women peacekeepers. The uh, initiative also looks at concrete obstacles for successful deployments and good working conditions. As an example, the fund approved a milestone project from the United Nations Interim Forces in Lebanon, and uh, it desi it's designed to provide gender sensitive accommodation for an increased number of women military peacekeepers deployed by Ghana with a project completion in September this year. Uh, the fund is also supporting a further 18 projects from 13 troop and police contributing countries, and we see that as an, a remarkable achievement uh, for the fund. So from UN Women's side, we firmly believe that enabling environment or to, to create enabling environments that promotes a diverse, inclusive and respectful work culture where women and men's contribution are seen as equally important and valued is the precondition for achieving and sustaining gender parity. UN Women has also a, a publication uh, for uh, field specific or with guidelines for field specific enabling um, uh, environments, uh, which is also, we think, concrete on how to make parity a reality and also how to make uh, working conditions good for both uh, women and men. And we are happy to continue to work with all of you uh, in order to, oh, we have it here. Good, Deborah, always prepared. <laughs> so we're really happy to continue to working with all of you uh, on these important issues. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Orsa, and, and thank you again to all our the speakers who just took the floor. We now will now transition to our panel discussion, and uh, it gives me great pleasure to welcome our panelists. If I can start by introducing from left to right, uh, Commissaire General Boronik um, Orebi de Plas is the Chief of uh, Mission Management and Support Section in UN Police Division. She has over 35 years of police experiencing or policing experience, sorry, at the senior level in both national and international contexts. Ms. Uh, Orebi de Plas has led several French police services, including operational and administrative units before joining the UN. She was director of airport security yeah. for France. Welcome. Um, to my immediate left, uh, we have uh, uh, Wing Commander Nkeshi Esionia, and I hope you, I pronounced it correctly, Ozudima, and she is currently working as a Capacity Development Officer in Policy at the Office of Military Affairs in the United Nations Department of Peace Operations. She began her career in the Nigerian Air Force in 2001, 
Ms. Uzodima is the first woman directing staff in the history of the Nigerian Armed Forces. And she was deployed to the UN mission in South Sudan, UNMIS, in 2017. Uh, welcome to you as well. And on my right, we have Brigadier General Sandra Kerr. Currently, uh, she works as a program management officer and expert on police performance in the Office of Peacekeeping Strategic Partnerships at the uh, UN Department of Peace Operations. She served in the UNAMA or in UNAMA as a police advisor from 2012 to 2013. And prior to this, Ms. Kaya uh, has worked for 35 years in the National Police, first in Amsterdam and then in the Gendarmerie of uh, the Netherlands. Um, so I would like to begin. First of all, I'd like to uh, also comment on a, on a point made by Thomas, because I joined UN peacekeeping around the same time and uh, in a mission that had 70,000 uniformed personnel. And I only remember a handful of women peacekeepers in the Danish battalion and the Nordic battalion in sector Northeast in Bosnia Herzegovina. Uh, the rest were of course male. And 15 years later, I was visiting uh, Unmel in Liberia and how the mission had changed to echo what you were saying not only was the leadership of uh, the mission uh, all women, uh, but also we had the first of the form formed police units from India, an all women uh, formed police unit, and uh, you know dramatic difference in the atmosphere of the mission. Um, I'd like to begin my questioning, if I can turn the first question to Sandra on my left, um, with the permission of the very distinguished officials on this. Uh, table, they've agreed that I can refer to them in their first names. Um, I, the official reason is because it's simpler to do it like that. The unofficial reason is that I only ever made it to first lieutenant. So I feel very intimidated by higher ranks. <laughs> so I prefer to just go to first names. But if I can turn to you, Sandra, in the last two years, you have been undertaking reviews of peacekeeping missions, including MINUSCA, uh, MONUSCO, and UNMIS. And in your trips to these operations, can you tell us about some of the best practices or lessons learned about how these missions are addressing the needs of women personnel? And what have peacekeepers told you? And what have you seen? Yeah, big question. Here I am, yes. Um, yeah, and as OPSP, we do refuse on mandate implementation in a broad perspective. Um, and uh, I also take a specific look at the role of female peacekeepers in, in the missions um, by talking with them, uh, looking at uh, their accommodation, uh, for example, etc. And um, well, a lot has been said about the women that are missing, but I actually have the opportunity to talk to the women that are not missing, but are there. And um, I think there are some, there's not one mission that does everything perfect, uh, uh, obviously. Uh, but I think there are elements in different missions that uh, uh, make it better uh, the position and the role of women. And first of all, I think that is integration. Integration in all tasks, in all roles, in all ranks. Um, integration with uh, uh, male, uh, uh, obviously, I mean, it's, it's the mas masculine roles uh, and the feminine roles is something that is like black and white. I think it's not black and white at all, but when you uh, look at it in that perspective, I think the additional competencies of men and women, uh, when they are integrated, they are most effective. Uh, and I'm not the only one thinking uh, uh, that it's, it's research, of course. Uh, but within the missions, uh, I mean, uh, with all respect for full female units, um, I think integration works more effective. Full female units can be effective in certain situations, uh, in certain uh, circumstances that is needed, then it can be very helpful. But generally speaking, I think integration uh, and mixed units uh, are far more effective. Um, and um, uh, also when uh, when it comes to leadership, I think leadership in this perspective uh, plays a huge role when it comes to inclusiveness and 
almost gender neutral, uh, have respect for competencies of people, uh, competencies of people in their different roles and tasks. Uh, and leadership is essential for that, but also to, um, to have a culture that is uh, open and transparent and is able to discuss issues. Um, I mean, it's not female issues. I think it's also male issues when it comes to harassment and things like that, uh, or work and living conditions. So uh, leadership, um, I mean, we go into the deep fields and we come to places that leadership has not been there. Uh, and I think that's amazing because I think leadership needs to be where things happen, uh, to see things, to uh, talk to people and to have an understanding what's happening in the deep field, especially under these uh, harsh conditions that we put our peacekeepers in. Uh, so I think that's also a very uh, important point. Um, the third point is uh, where there are a lot of be best practices, but also a lot of uh, uh, improvements. It's the accommodation and the living conditions. And um, I think we see a lot of um, deplorable conditions that we put our peacekeepers in, unfortunately. And um, I, I totally agree that we have to, I mean, pilots and projects uh, to see what, what can be a more adaptive or a more gender responsive uh, uh, environment it's, it's really good and uh, I really encourage that. But on the other hand, some things are really basic and some things I think shouldn't be this complicated. And it's about flexibility, for example. Mm -hmm. When we see that uh, the number of women changes with rotations and we, don't, uh, we are not able to uh, um, accommodate uh, um, more women in the next rotation, I mean, these are basic things and flexibility in the accommodation, I think it's not that complicated. And I think it's really important to, for women to have their own space also to be amongst them and to be uh, in that perspective when it comes to living, uh, be separate uh, uh, from uh, their male colleagues. Um, and that's, that's a thing of uh, safety and security, uh, I think. And uh, we still see a situation where that's not made possible. And I think those basic things um, should definitely be improved. Uh, but I'll, I'll stop there because, <laughs> yeah. No, well, thank you, uh, Sandra. And if I can now turn to Nketchi. Um, UN Security Council Resolution 2538 on women in peacekeeping was groundbreaking in that it urges, it urged or urges the UN and uh, TCC, PCCs to provide adequate and appropriate infrastructure and facilities for women in missions, um, such as accommodation, sanitation, healthcare, and uh, protective equipment. We've just heard from Sandra her own uh, impressions that in some mission settings, uh, the situation is, is still uh, in need of improvement. Did any of these elements serve as barriers or enablers to your own participation in peacekeeping? And why is it important to pay attention to improving these aspects of missions? Please. Okay. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank the organizers, the hosts, for giving me the opportunity to come and share my experience and also to discuss on, um, on barriers and increasing um, opportunities to increase meaningful participation of women in peacekeeping. Um, I'll share my experience in ONMIS. I was uh, deployed to ONMIS in 2017. And at that time, okay, in Juba, the accommodation, I was there for about a week in which um, we had to do the induction training course. And the accommodation was suitable. We had restroom facilities in every corner in the, the walk area and um, the living um, accommodation also. We had um, toilet facilities that were actually attached to um, the rooms or the, or, or the, the, the farms. So on getting to, um, to Bentu, that was my final place of deployment. On getting to Bentu, the, there was a far cry um, of difference between what I saw in Juba and what was available in Bentu. Um, for me, the experience was very frustrating. Why? I, we had at that time 
just one ablution for the females that was functional. And no matter where your room was, you had to find your way down to that ablution. Um, and this was very inconveniencing. Um, unfortunately, my room was very far away from the ablution, so you could imagine. And so for me, I had, I had to treat um, UTIs. I had to treat um, infections severally. Why? Because I had to retain urine for longer time before I could uh, um, go to use the restroom. We're, we're all aware that for women, we actually have peculiarities. Um, these range from um, our frequency in, uh, in bladder activities, um, privacy, um, down up to some sanitary um, issues at certain part, times of the month. And so, putting into consideration some of these peculiarities in appropriate and suitable accommodation would actually encourage and improve uh, the participation, the meaningful participation of women, especially for the uniformed um, in peacekeeping. Uh, I would also like to mention, I know um, right now the UN uh, DOS, um, the, ASG, the USG, um, Carrie has already mentioned that some effort has been made concerning some of this, um, this particular barrier that is accommodation and facilities, uh, making it more gender sensitive and to improve um, or enable a, a better working environment. I would like to encourage that remote areas of the mission should be looked into because we tend to forget these areas most times. And um, it would improve not only the UN, uh, the, the peacekeeping experience, but also encourage people back home, you know, to want to volunteer to uh, peacekeeping. I'll stop here. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mkechi. Um, would uh, anyone else like to just reflect on this point? Veronique, I'm going to also turn to you, but also you can maybe reflect on your own experiences. Um, there was, we issued at IPI a paper on the perceptions and lived realities of women police officers in UN peace operations, and it found that women are expected to integrate into masculine policing rather than the institutions changing to be more inclusive for, for everyone. And we see that women are often turned to for solutions and are expected to do the extra labor to improve the workplace. Um, do you have examples of men who adapted to the needs of others in the workplace and championed more respectful cultures? And what did they do specifically? So the three questions rolled into one. Very I hope you forgive me. Please. Thank you. But actually, the, the, the last one is a very um, difficult, or, or should I say dangerous question. Let's imagine I say, no, I don't have any example of men who adapted. What can you say? <laughs> so I'm joking, but uh, I'm joking, but you know, I, I belong to a, a generation because I'm not so young uh, where things were um, very difficult, I should say at the beginning at least, and especially in the police. Uh, I guess in other military should be the same. In other institutions, maybe things were uh, easier. But uh, when I began to 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 be a, a police commissioner, so meaning the, the the level which is supposed to 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 give orders and to command other peoples, um, it, it was difficult. It was difficult because the men were not used to that. Uh, especially in the police, once more, and um, I can have a terrible example, uh, but funny examples, uh, where they were very surprised to see me because I was 25 years old, and uh, I, at the beginning of my career in the Prefecture de Police, which is the, the, the Paris police, uh, I had uh, in my functions the public order the management of the crowd control, which is typically masculine, uh, and I had to, to command, uh, excuse me, my English words are not the, the right ones, uh, to command the CRS. CRS are the Compagnie Républicaine de Sécurité, which means uh, the, the troops, the, the police troops that um, keep the public order, uh, right. uh, and especially in the stadiums, 
in the stadiums where football matches uh, occurs. And you can imagine what kind of people uh, are going to see those matches. There are a lot of uh, incidents and, and, and problems. And the first time I arrived with my uh, driver, who was a big and tall man with a mustache, uh, it was my driver not to, to, to take me shopping, but to, to, to take all the notes uh, for everything happening uh, during this match and, and took me from one place to another. And uh, so he walked beside me uh, and uh, we, we were going to meet the, the, the commandant of the CRS, which, who, who was supposed to be under my orders. And the commandant of the CRS arrived and he see my driver and I, and he said, my respect to my driver. And so the, so the driver said, this is Mrs. Weiser. And I thought he was going to make a, a heart attack uh, because he, he couldn't imagine a second that I was going, the one who was going to, to give him orders during this, uh, this event. Uh, and I have many, many other examples. And nothing was made to help us because, you know, the, the, especially in, uh, in, in France, I know that in uh, Anglo-Saxon countries, it's a bit different, but the rhythm of work is very difficult for a woman because you, you end very late in the evening. And they used to put meetings at 6 or 7 p.m. Uh, so you can imagine, and, and a lot of men are asking a lot of absolutely unuseful questions uh, at 7.30. Uh, and, and so I was looking at my watch and I have to, to get the kids to give them food, to wash them and when they are sick to take them to the doctors and so on and so forth. And I was like, yes, okay, Is it soon finished. No, I have a question. What do you think of my gosh, Are they going to shut up? Uh, and, and nobody could imagine that it was difficult to, to have meetings lasting till 8 or 8.30 p.m. Um, but, but all this was a long time ago. And I must say that Things are little by little improving, uh, even in the police or maybe in the army, and that the needs of the women are more and more taken in consideration. And the thing I observed since I've arrived in the United Nations, which is very um, recent because I'm, I've been there only for one year, uh, and maybe you will find me uh, optimistic, too optimistic, but um, I think it's an institution where these needs are really taken in consideration. Uh, and um, I've heard a lot of things about uh, gender equity. You can tell me, yes, but what is going, what is happening on the field? But I think that the first step is to, to, to speak of it, because if you don't speak of it, it's not going to happen on the field anyway. So by hearing all the time, because really in PD, in police department, uh, and I guess it's the same thing in, in military uh, department, uh, we speak a lot of gender equity. Uh, we have a lot of trainings about gender equity. And you know, by hearing that all day long, I think that something will stay. Uh, and as I don't forget that your question was giving you an example of man, uh, I think I should uh, highlight the, the efforts of uh, the former police commissioner, Luis Carrillo, who left a few weeks ago, uh, because he, he, he championed the, the establishment of the PD level, uh, level women's network. Uh, he held uh, regular meetings with women. Uh, he, he supported the, the DPPO, DPA uh, survey on uh, barriers of uh, uniform uniform personnel and uh, and he, he made a lot of efforts in in our um, police uh, uh, senior team meetings to to emphasize uh, uh, everything that that has to be done uh, to 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 reach this goal of uh, of uh, equity uh, so i know that a lot of things have still to be done but um, i think that you united nation is a really a, a great place to 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 support this and 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 ju just look where we are here. Thanks to you, thanks to you all. Uh, we, we are talking of that, and 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 we're uh, we're in the good way. Thank you for that, uh, Veronique. Um, if I can come back to you and Ketchy. Um, so Sandra uh, spoke of, in her opinion, the importance of integration as opposed to having sort of distinct units of one gender or another. Um, in, we often hear from women peacekeepers the importance of creating networks across components um, that enables all peacekeepers to feel better supported and informed about what is expected when they deploy and are better equipped to tackle the challenges that may arise. In your opinion, how do you think the UN and member states can better support these efforts to create networks? And can you share how you established a sense of 
community in your own mission environment? Um, yeah, sure. Most um, member states actually have a national women's network. Uh, for the uniformed personnel, um, most countries, whether informal or formal, they do have, a number of them do have um, some form of network, uh, which actually helps um, support awareness in sharing information and the rest. For me, um, in my country, that was that network was the first um, point of contact with information, relevant information when I was going to be deployed uh, for peacekeeping. And so I would like to encourage uh, uh, member states that you know having such um, networks, women, military or uniform personnel networks helps a lot. And for those who already have existing ones um, that are even formal, supporting and uh, strengthening um, these networks actually help because it, it's a support system that helps, uh, especially with relevant information, it helps um, career opportunities and it helps also um, a kind of di discussions on, on in, um, topics of interest. Now, uh, for me also, I'm now sharing my experience. Uh, when I was about to be deployed, one thing, another thing that helped me was the female military officers course, uh, because they had a network. They encouraged us to have um, an informal network within our, our course participants. And that helped because um, I was able to reach out and I was able to find out that I had um, a, a former participant who was actually in Juba at that time. And she was able to provide me with relevant information concerning that mission, which was even a little bit different from what I got from my network back home that helped me in preparing myself for the mission. On getting to Bentu, there was no network. There was that support system was not there, it was missing. So whether formal or informal, it, it was just not there. And so I was isolated. Um, it was difficult trying to uh, break into um, certain groups, you know, which probably group of friends or whatever. So I was totally isolated. Information that was relevant to me, you know, came in in trickles if they even did come in at all. and. That's um, something we could look at, you know, that would help, especially in the mission. Um, I just want to bring out that in UNHQ, I've been here for about three years. We do have a, a women's military network, um, which actually comprises of um, female military officers within UNHQ and our counterparts within the permanent missions. And um, this gives a forum in which we share important information. We talk about um, topics of interest. We share experience, um, even career opportunities, training. And this has actually helped us bond better, helped us discuss our challenges, and help us even come up with solutions that could help. Uh, uh, even those in the missions, in our work, daily work. And so um, more recently, I know, I think ONPOL and um, Justice and Corrections had something, uh, a network, a female network. Uh, it would be good to also have a military female network. So I'm, I'm throwing this open. Yeah, it, it would be a good one. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, Veronique, if I can come back to you, and then we, I'll come back to Sandra. But the global uh, MOWIP report by DCAF and Cornell University recommends that the UN recruit, select, and develop peacekeeping personnel based on their skills, of course, but also paying attention to their attitudes, assumptions, and approach to gender equality and sustainable peace. You know, how do you uh, see these characteristics as supportive of a more uh, receptive environment for women in peace operations? 
Yes, of, of course, um, if, if systematically considered and applied as uh, core skills required for the development, uh, deployments uh, in peace operation, uh, this characteristic would contribute uh, to, to a more gender sensitive uh, enabling, enabling environment uh, that would promote the full, uh, equal and meaningful participation of women and men in peace operation and ultimately uh, greater gender equality. Uh, it's, it's, it's obvious. And um, I must uh, underline that, uh, uh, point out that we have uh, in police division, uh, and, and I think uh, not only in police division, uh, regular and uh, mandatory uh, awareness programs for, uh, for all uh, to provide a guidance on the relevant uh, policy and procedures to, to foster the creation of a harmonious uh, uh, respectful and gender sensitive uh, working environment, uh, including uh, um, some, some mandatory pre deployment training, for example, on prevention of sexual harassment and uh, abuse by UN personnel. Um, we have uh, an introduction to gender equality for United Nations. Uh, we have regular bulletins of the United Police uh, Professional Standards Unit. Uh, we have interactive sessions uh, with conduct and discipline uh, teams. Uh, so we have many, many tools uh, to try to, 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 to implement the, the, this uh, fruitful and uh, respectful uh, environment. Uh, I, I think uh, it's, it's a condition for a better equality. No, I, I, I would completely agree with all my years uh, in and around the UN. Um, the UN, I've always felt the UN is a reflection of the world out there. It's, it's a, in one way, no better, no worse. But where the difference can be made is where you have the intersection between the secretariat, uh, the sort of the, one of the principal organs of the UN, and where the member states work together. At that point, you know, we ought to be presenting a better model than the societies in, from which we will come. And I think that's the point that you were stressing. And, and, but there is, of course, the other side. And, and here, Sandra, if I could turn to, to you, research from IPI and DCAF has shown that both men and women experience uh, sexual harassment and social exclusion, including bullying and discrimination. How can the UN and peacekeeping leaders take these lessons and begin to change the culture of missions so that they feel uh, safer and more uh, respect, respected as peacekeepers in, uh, and how and uh, make peacekeeping operations as diverse as possible? Um, yeah, that's a good question. Um, I think, again, leadership is key, uh, but also the standard we set as UN and TCCs and PCCs together. Um, the standard is a basic foundation. Um, uh, Veronique already told all the trainings, all the uh, whether it's in pre-deployments or uh, within uh, HQ uh, over here. Um, it's it's a really important set of, uh, uh, of standard or foundation, but it's not uh, the solution. I mean. I think we um, tend, when there are problems, we tend to uh, uh, get back to these kind of solutions by training. We, in missions, we sometimes see that uh, units get once a week a training about SEA, and um, once a week the same training. So it's, I mean, repetence is important, but uh, keeping. Uh, uh, keep on saying that it's a zero tolerance uh, or whether it's harassment as, uh, or conduct and discipline in the, in the broad perspective, it is actually a starting point. And I think the conversation, uh, how to op oper operationalize that, that is the important thing that can make a difference. So um, we, um, we ask a lot from our peacekeepers. Um, by uh, yelling at them, there's a zero to tolerance policy it's not enough. You really have to open up what problems do you face? How do we communicate with each other? Uh, how do we cope being in these difficult situation? Whether it's men, women, everybody. And especially for the uniforms, it's always finding the balance 
between being all the same and being uh, and appreciating diversity and being able to be yourself within a uniformed uh, unit. Um, and I think leadership is essential to have these conversations and to create a culture where you can address issues. Um, I think there are a lot of taboos still. Um, and I think stepping forward in these kind of things ask for a uh, uh, real strong leadership in that perspective. And I also think um, that the, I'm a bit positive about the younger generation when it comes to gender uh, roles and uh, addressing issues that are uh, relevant. So I really think, but the decision makers are, well, my or not our, because I see a lot of younger people here, but my generation. So I really think we should also um, give them the floor to, to discuss issues and to address situations, whether uh, it's from a male perspective, female perspective, uh, other perspective, LGBTQ. Um, I think it's really important to open up the floor to have these difficult conversations. And of course, I realize in, I mean, we are coping with a lot of different cultures. So some issues are harder to discuss for some cultures or, but we, uh, I really think the difference can be made there. So the standard, I think the standard, working on the standard is really good as a foundation, but we have to make a step forward um, uh, by having the real good conversations. Yeah. And, oh, sorry but, to it. And I think there are also instruments we can, I mean, the network is, I think, from a huge importance that you have people you can, uh, uh, whether it's trust, um, trust people or uh, from a network, uh, body systems, uh, I think those instruments can really help uh, for individuals and also for groups to uh, make these steps forward. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Sandra. And I, I think you're absolutely right. There are some extremely complicated issues that need to be settled. And uh, here, I, I would beg the member states present to no longer just keep the issue of a framework or a draft convention on criminal accountability for UN officials and experts on mission sitting there year after year in the sixth committee. It's the 16th year, it's, it's not moving anywhere. It's languishing, there's a working group. Without it, we're not serious ab about addressing harassment once it crosses over to abuse and criminal abuse. So all the UN can do is then dismiss you know, if you had a case of a civilian peacekeeper, male, abusing uh, to a criminal extent, a military female officer or a soldier from another country, all the UN can do is dismiss from service at the maximum extent. And that person, unless they're covered by extraterritorial jurisdiction, is basically free. And how can you send the message that at extreme end, the UN will not tolerate it if the member states do not take this step in sixth committee and get this resolution through. So I, I beg the member states to do this uh, finally. Um, we've reached the end of our time with the panelists. Could you please give a round of applause to the three of them for their excellent presentation? Um, we will now turn to the final few comments uh, before opening up uh, to questions from the audience. And I'm delighted to invite Colonel Gang Hukwag, and I hope I, I pronounce your name correctly, the Mongolia's military advisor to make an intervention. Uh, we have a microphone, please. Yeah, right there. Thank you, Colonel. Please. Thank you, Mr. Chair, for giving me a bit of love. Uh, Mr. Chair and Excellencies, um, it's an honor for me to be part of this important event. And I also would like to thank the IPA and Mission of Canada and all the co-sponsor uh, member states. And I also would like to thank all the panelists for the distinguished service and the experience shared with us today. Mongolia has been constantly supporting the UNPKO initial initiatives, most notably improving peacekeeping performance and importantly, increasing the participation of women peacekeeping impressions. We have committed to contributing more uniform personal to UNPKO as one of our foreign policy goals. And over the last 15 years, we have deployed over 1,000 female uh, military personnel to UNPKO. For implementation of the UN uh, Uniform Gender Parity Strategy, Mongolia intends to meet the target by 2028. 
we are working to develop five-year national action plan to build the capacity of female military personnel. I'm pleased to inform that when we complete our military rotation in South Sudan end of this year, uh, female represent representation of the contingent will increase from 7 to 11 percent and will continue to do so. Mr. Chair, last year Mongolia hosted an international conference for female peacekeepers as its contribution to implementing the UN WPS agenda. The conference attracted 80 military participants from 30 countries, representing all the continent. We intend to, uh, to host this conference in every five years. The purpose of this conference was to discuss the implementation of the UN strategy, to identify the challenges facing the female recruitment, training, and selection of women at all levels of the military service, and exchange their views on best practice ways to overcoming the challenges. Let me share some of the takeaways from the conference. In fact, uh, Wing Commander Nikishi was uh, participated in the conference. Uh, she was the uh, one of these finalists, and I hope she will agree and endorse my, uh, my, my takeaways. The conference panelists concluded that although there is a progress in the implementation of the UN strategy, there are significant challenges that risk the achievement of the 28 goals. This include underrepresentation of the women in national militaries, in leadership in decision-making positions, equal access to training, stereotype, mindset, and working environment. Additionally, several barriers and challenges remain with respect to deploying war women in UNPKO. The experience is shared by many TCCs online closely with the 10 barriers identified by the, by the LC initiatives. The mission work environment, the issue of inadequate facilities were also raised during discussions and through better awareness in mission training, including gender responsive leadership training to overcome the challenge. In conclusion, Mr. Mr. Chair, there is a growing global commitment to address these issues in order to see concrete and meaningful change with respect to more women's deployment to UNPKL. I thank you for your attention. Thank you. Oops, sorry. Thank you. Thank you, Colonel. And if I could turn to your neighbor, Mr. Kiyohiko uh, Hasegawa uh, from the Office of uh, the Victims' Rights Advocate. Please, sir, you have. Thank you, President Zaid um, and IPI Canada uh, for hosting this event and to all the panelists for the engaging discussions. And thank you for the opportunity to deliver very short remarks on behalf of the UN's Victims' Rights Advocate, uh, Jane Connors, who sends her regrets for not being able to join all of you here today. Um, we've come a long way in the 17 years since the Zaid report, um, but uh, the prevalence of sexual misconduct across the UN over the years uh, reflects a depressing reality, which is that these are not isolated scandals, but uh, systemic behavior rooted in deeply entrenched discrimination, unequal gender relations, and situations of vulnerability. The Victims' Rights Advocates mandate created by the Secretary General five years ago in 2017 puts the rights and dignity of victims of sexual exploitation and abuse at the forefront of the organization's response. And her mandate is operationalized on the ground through senior victims' rights officers who coordinate assistance to victims of sexual exploitation and abuse. And in some countries, they are supported by uh, women UMPOL officers who have the skills and experience within their national police forces in tackling sexual and gender-based violence. And together with the senior victims' rights officers, they are making a difference. We also know that the drivers of both sexual exploitation and abuse and sexual harassment are similar. And so we are seeing increasing numbers of victims of sexual harassment also approaching the victims' rights advocate and senior victims' rights officers for advice. And so we find people really turn to those they can trust to champion their rights. And as for women peacekeepers and also male peacekeepers in mission environments, we would recommend the designation of a dedicated focal point um, who can provide advice and information. And the Victims' Rights Advocate looks forward to working with the LC initiative in the next five years to see um, ways to collaborate. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Hasagawa, for, for those comments. Uh, well, the, the time now is for all of you to participate, not everyone to ask a question, but we want to make uh, the microphone available to anyone who would like uh, to ask a question of the distinguished panelists. There's sort of the formal discussion has ended, but of course we can respond to questions that you may have. Um, so would anyone like to take the floor? I, I do have one question from uh, a Zoom. Uh, uh, participant, but perhaps from the floor, please. 
And if you could introduce yourself uh, before you ask the question. Yes, of course. Good morning. I'm Major Bernicke from France. I, I have no question. In fact, it's more a share of experience too, because uh, I was deployed three years ago in Minoso as a military observer. So I was uh, serving in a team site where we were only 15 military observers and only two women. And so um, I totally uh, share the experience that were uh, given here. And uh, I want to insist on a point that Sandra uh, said, is that uh, if we could take very basic action, actions uh, on the, in the field to improve uh, women conditions. Because um, in my case, I was also sleeping in a room very far away from the bathroom. And uh, I had the same uh, feeling uh, as you, uh, Nikki. So even I think a, a simple action would be to sensitize and encourage the mission leaders to just, uh, for example, uh, attribute the rooms uh, near the bathroom or simple things like that. And then um, I also wanted to say that um, the network is very important. And uh, unfortunately, I had no chance to participate to any training before coming. So I think it's also a national responsibility to encourage women to participate in that such trainings. Uh, after the mission, I participated to the female military officer course, and it was very interesting. I made a lot of contacts. And so I think it's important to encourage women to get trained before deployed. And uh, last point would be uh, to, I don't know if it's existing really, but uh, to ensure that we are monitoring all the results of the programs that are uh, implemented. So we could get some data to, you know, to, to measure how effectively uh, the initiatives are improving women uh, conditions, living conditions. That's it. Thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, it's a very pertinent comment uh, you made. I, I don't know if there, any of you would like to respond to it. Um, I, I, just listening to you, of course, makes me think how you know complicated this whole peacekeeping setup is. No, you, the, the law travels with the, the military units. So you're governed by your internal law, so to speak, but the UN requires, as per the MOU, certain minimum standards. And the, the problem I think that all of you are highlighting is that in headquarters, where you have a concentration of personnel, you can see something approaching what we'd want to see. It's more the outlying districts in far removed areas where the inattention, because for obvious reasons, distance and time make it like, like that. The inattention leads to a sort of a, uh, or can lead to uh, the exercise of poor leadership if you don't have proper um, sort of, let's say, officers who are attentive to these issues. I mean, going back to your point, uh, Sandra, I mean, I felt when I was asked by Kofi Annan to look at all the problem areas, that the backbone of the peacekeeping operations was at company command level. That if you could get the company commanders to understand what is required, you could deal with a lot of problems. And you don't necessarily have to train everyone. One of the things we found, for instance, in diversity, equity, and inclusion in the business world is that training has failed. Training has just failed massively, and there's a lot of literature on it because people don't like to be told what to do. So you have to do it in a way that's culturally, that's going to work and uh, that makes them really understand emotionally how they have to change. But if you're told, you tick the box, you say, I did the training, and often it doesn't go anywhere. So I, these lessons, I think, are what we're gleaning from the LC initiative and need to sort of uh, continue to work on. But thank you for your, your comments. Yeah. Is there anyone else who would like to, to ask a question? Yeah. Could I just then end with one question from Zoom, and it's from an old friend of mine we served together in peacekeeping, Nina Lahoud, and she asks, in conjunction with the LC initiatives, focus on more gender-friendly infrastructure in UN peacekeeping operations. I seek the views of the panelists on whether they consider there is equally 
that it is equally important for the UN to consider implementing more robust temporary special measures in terms of selection and recruitment criteria. In other words, seniority years of prior service for women police officers and military observers in order to broaden the pool of eligible uh, women for recruitment in these areas or in these categories. And who would like to, to answer that? Sandra, you will move toward the microphone. So I take that as, as a sign of intent. Yeah, I think um, when it comes to competencies, um, it's, it's, yeah, it's always, I mean, especially for these kind of environments, it's always hard to, well, how do you measure candidates in that perspective? Um, and, but I think, um, and I, I, Veronique, I don't know if you, but uh, when it comes to, uh, for example, for uh, uh, police advisors or uh, uh, different roles within the uh, missions for uh, police officers, uh, there's a um, um, 52, I think, is the uh, the top age that you can uh, uh, work in a mission. Um, the ranks uh, are uh, sometimes really hard to compare in the different uh, uh, TCCs and PCCs. Uh, so also in these kind of perspective, um, it's it's hard to put one. Uh, um, uh, well, a set of requirements uh, when we want uh, different profiles, when we want a uh, new generation, I think broadening the requirements in that perspective or me be more flexible uh, would also help. So you can ask for an extended uh, um, experience in all different kinds of fields, or you can ask for an, an, another vision, another perspective, and maybe younger people in, uh, for certain roles. I don't know if it answers the question, but that is what comes up uh, in my mind. Uh, and especially on the age you, 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 yeah. you talked about, because uh, you, you can't move so easily when you have kids, uh, young kids and so on. So uh, if you um, lower uh, the, the age, uh, then you, you, it's, it's not in favor of women. <laughs> so, you but know, if I only take my, my own example, which is not, of course, comparable mm -hmm. to what happens, yeah. what happened on the field, but I, I wouldn't have been able to come here, even if it's only New York, yeah. uh, be, before, because, because my husband was working, because my kids were, uh, mm -hmm. and so on and so forth. And, and but, it's New York, let's imagine yeah. what it is in, in some countries. So, But I really think flexibility is issue. I don't have kids. I don't have a partner. So for me, that situation is totally different. So I really think we should be aware of all the differences and have that flexibility for uh, one. I mean, women in the Netherlands get uh, uh, start having children on quite a high age. So that's different from other countries where they are really young uh, having children. So all these differences, uh, we cannot make a list of an ideal situation. I think we should be aware of the differences and we should be in our systems, be as flexible as possible to, um, well, to get the diversity of situations, uh, um, well, being able to go for a job within the UN or, because I mean, and I really think that um, maybe we should promote more, we should, I mean, there are a lot of problems and we always, I also tend to do so, to look at these problems. But I see so many dedicated, proud women working in the missions and being totally happy uh, uh, with the way they are working. And uh, uh, besides the improvements that should be made, I think we should also uh, uh, um, highlight these success stories a bit more maybe. So especially for women who are thinking in problems like, okay, how am I gonna cope in these deep fields? And uh, I mean, all the basic issues that come to mind. The other side is that it's really fantastic to work in the missions and have your contribution to peacekeeping. And I would like to add, if you, if you're alone. I would like to add something more general. You know, sometimes and quite often I hear around me, Oh yes, um, a lot have been done uh, for the woman, but now it's becoming too much. Uh, you know, we have to 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 recruit a woman, uh, even if they're not so good. And and no, now it's too much. And I, I'd like to 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 say first, it's never too much. And second, I'd like to quote 
uh, a famous political woman in France who was called Françoise Giroud, but I don't think you, you know her. And, and she used to say, uh, and I love this sentence, uh, the real equality uh, will be reached when an incompetent woman will be appointed at a high position. Yeah, yeah. And I love that because it, it means that so many incompetent men have been appointed because they were men. But now if we have women incompetent, I don't care. Honestly, I don't care. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, uh, Veronique. And, um, and thank you, uh, uh, all of you, really, for your uh, comments, Sandra. And catch it so so it, we now started uh, our session this morning with Ambassador Bob Ray. We're going to end with Ambassador Bob Ray. You are the sort of alpha and the omega of this session. So please, Ambassador. Well, thank you very much. Uh, don't worry, it's not going to be long. I, I just want to say a couple of things. Um, I I had the privilege of leading a government thirty years ago. Uh, where um, um, half the cabinet were women. Uh, and uh, my first meeting with my security uh, director was to say, um, why, don't, why don't I have any, any security uh, women in the, uh, attached to the security detail? And he said, that's never happened before, Premier. I said, well, it's now going to happen. And he said, I'm not sure we can find the right people. I said, you'll find them. And so it, it, I think it's a matter of changing, just changing mindsets and just making, making the changes happen. Um, one thing we do know for sure is that uh, uh, just as imperial habits die hard, patriarchal habits die hard. And we, we still have a lot of work to do. I wanna pick up on one point that Nketchi made that I think is really important. And that is that if we don't make these changes happen, we will not be able to attract women into these jobs for one very simple reason. Certainly in my country, we don't knock on the door of a house and say, you're going to, uh, you're going to Burundi next week. It doesn't work like that. You have to recruit people. You have to ask people. People have to volunteer. People have to come forward. And if we don't respond to the need to, to change conditions, the physical conditions, Yes, critically important. And I really appreciated everybody's candor in talking about that, particularly again in Ketchy. I think it was very important that people hear simple realities, biological realities, and just say, for goodness sake, we gotta be able to deal with this. That we have to think about it as we plan missions, think about what are the, what are the structural changes that we need to make. And then we have to really be prepared to, 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 to make it happen, to make it happen. And it's not just the physical surroundings that need to change, continue to change. It's the, it's the surroundings between our ears that need to change. And I think that uh, the comments that have been made are really important. We certainly have to celebrate how far we've come, but we need to understand that we're nowhere near a point where we can say it's done, like we're here and it's all perfect and everything's happened. We're not there yet. We have to be honest about that. It is still, you're still finding attitude mindsets that say, uh, just as you've described it, oh, I think it's gone far enough. I've heard this, I mean, I've, uh, I've heard this for a long time. People say, oh, no, 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 that's enough. That's enough. You're pushing too far. And you say, no, we're not pushing too far because we still haven't reached the point where uh, we put an end to sexual harassment, where people understand that this behavior is intolerable, where we've ended discrimination, where mindsets are open, fully open to the full participation, full equal participation of women in every position, including the greatest positions of leadership. I would say though, in response to Veronique, when she said the, the quote from Francois Giroux, I have to say over the last few months, I feel that we may have reached the point where actually we're at the point where both men and women can be equally incompetent in senior jobs. It's not, it's not there's no discrimination there. We've see, seen it happen. But we need to we need to appreciate the fact that we as we move forward, as we move forward, we need to move forward together. And Canada is very committed to working in partnership and to continuing to work. There's a good podcast that comes out that's put on by the uh, by uh, the the group, and it's it's something I encourage everybody to listen to. There's lots of ways for us to improve um, our understanding and knowledge and awareness. 
Uh, and I, I just think it's, uh, it's wonderful to have been able to have this discussion and uh, to, uh, to have had an opportunity to listen, uh, which since I'm gonna stop talking, I'll say it, 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 it's better to listen than it is to talk, although I've talked a bit, but I just wanna thank everybody for this. I wanna thank IPI, all of our partners, all of our fellow sponsors, all of the panelists, for doing such a tremendous job at making us realize what, how much we have done, how much we're doing, but how much more there is to do. And the only test of this will be our ability to attract and to recruit in a way that will make a difference. And unless we improve things, we, we won't be able to do that. So that's the incentive for us to make it happen. Thank you so much. Merci beaucoup. Perfect.